Well, welcome to Tea Time. You know what time that means. It means that Miss Liz is here to tell you another story with some more words and some incredible guests. That's right. We do it different on Tea Time with Miss Liz. We don't serve a beverage. We serve storytelling and words and incredible stories and incredible individuals from across the globe. Today, I have the incredible Joyce Fiddler in the house, and we're going to talk about her uh, tea, and her tea is Tenacious, Enlightenment, and Awakening. And we're going to talk about her incredible book, which I got to read. I got my own copy. So be sure to check that out. We're going to put the links and all of that in, in the comment section for you to grab your copy as well. But before we get started, we're going to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. We're going to get you to ring that little doorbell. And then you'll be notified when these tea times are live. Or you can watch a replay tea time, which I have over 300 plus interviews with over 67 different countries uh, from all walks of life. And I guarantee that there's one topic on there that will grab your tea and grab your attention. And I en encourage everyone to just share these tea times, get them out. If they resonate and you think that it'll help a friend or it's just a good conversation or a good uh, time to listen to something different, then Miss Liz is a place to check out and share. So let's get started with the disclaimer and the bio, and then we're going to get Joyce in here. And I hope I'm saying her last name right. If not, I'm going to get her to pronounce it for me when I get her out here. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live Show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All Tea Time guests and the audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all regular tea times are done on a Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. If you see it on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a rescheduled special or surprise tea time. So today we have a special tea time. We have Joyce Fiddler in the house. So a little bit about my guest. Well, Joyce Fiddler is a first time writer whose precious compensation comp, compositions include included songs from her 80s new wave band her foray foray into writing comes after a busy life as a co-owner of a record store head shop singer with a video on mtv to a song she wrote university communication instructor secondary special educator and an actor she wrote a one-woman show, Evolutions of a Pisces, Baby Boomer, what she staged to full, to full houses five times at, the, at three Los Angeles theaters prior to the COVID pandemic. An army brat who lived in Germany, Japan, and around the U.S., Joyce and her hot husband lives in Los Angeles, where they recently celebrated 25 years of marriage, a perso personal best. Her grown daughters, who both survived her lousy parenting, are thriving in L.A. and in Australia and their beautiful families. Joyce has a B.A. from P Purdue in speech education and theater, an M.S. in radio television from Butler, and special education credentials from Cal State Northridge. Let me get Joyce in here and let's spill some tea together. 
Welcome, Joyce. Hi, so good to be here. Thanks. <laughs> it is a pleasure to have you here. And we were in the background, we were just talking about a bunch of stuff. And I was like, oops, I got to get ready. You've got to get going. So <laughs> Joyce, let's get started with you. Who was Joyce as a little girl and who is Joyce now? Well, um, as you read in my book, my mother said I was a uh, like a live wire from the time I was born. And I think that's a pretty apt description. Um, I've always been hyper energetic. When I taught uh, college, every semester students have to turn in an evaluation form. And inevitably, there would be several who would say, she's got so much energy. So my uh, nickname is Energoyce, like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> and so, yeah, people refer to me as Energoyce. And I think that's that's pretty much how I came out the gate. So Joyce, have you changed much as, um, as a grown woman? I wouldn't say so. Uh, I was, when I was in elementary school, I remember I used to, out on the playground at recess, I would chase boys around and get them down on the ground and kiss them and, or make them kiss me. <laughs> and then when I was in college, I um, picked my university, Purdue was, um, I selected it because they had in their student ratio, they had seven men to every woman. <laughs> and I, I was like, sign me up. That sounds like a great place to go. Uh, and to this day, I'd say I'm pretty boy crazy. Um, I'm really happy that I uh, am married to the man that I am. But I was boy crazy as an adult. Um, and 10 years into my first marriage, I think uh, again, as you read in the book, uh, I told my husband I wanted to date and promptly met a younger guy who I was crazy about. So I moved him in with us for only the last six years of our marriage. Well, what I really liked about your book, and I read your book, and I, like I told you, I'm going to read it again because it's such an easy read, right? So, uh, you know, what I like is I like a free flowing book. But like I had mentioned to you before we went live, some of the chapters did trigger me and I'm good with that. Uh, you know, uh, you talk about addictions and recovery and stuff as well, which we'll get into a little later in the show. But um, I just love to talk the, the, the book. It reminds me of the 80s. Yes. You know, it reminds me of MTV. And yes. we'll, we'll be talking about that. It reminds me of fun times. And free falling, you know, like where we had the bell bottom pants and the hippie, and you know, where we were, where we were able to say, Hey dude, like how you doing dude? And you know what I mean? Like we don't talk like that anymore, but totally. I, the book was really an easy read. And I really want to thank you for sending me a personal signed copy as well, Joyce. Cause I, I, I love when my guests and me connect that well. Right. Uh -huh. And I, and I can say, you know what? I read the book and I know this author, um, but I the evolution of a baby boomer. Um, and what I really loved about it is uh, Miss Liz has partnered with babyboomer.org. So we got baby boomers listening to Yay. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so Joyce, could we can you tell me a little bit about the evolution of a baby boomer? Well, um, I started writing the book 20 years ago. Um, I my mother was going through some health stuff and I was spending a lot of time at the hospital while she had her treatments. She was going into a hyperbaric oxygenation tank uh, in order to heal some wounds. And um, I had to be there at four or five hours at a time. So I just thought, well, what am I doing? I, I'll just start writing. And um, then when I married my now husband, he said, he saw all these legal pads and he said, what is all this? I said, oh, you know, I was writing and I thought maybe I'd turn it into a book someday. And he said, well, you should do it. And so um, I took a class. I'm, I'm in LA and you can find a class on anything. And so I took a class called How to Write a Memoir. <laughs> and it was a weekend <laughs> class. And then... Um, and, and I just kind of followed the script that the teacher gave us, which was quite a simple one. Basically, if any of your listeners, any baby boomers out there thinking about writing your story, I encourage you to do it. And the thing she said is write down the, I don't remember if it was 10 or 12, most exciting, most interesting things 
that have happened in your life because no one wants to read about the dull stuff. <laughs> you know, they really want to read about the adventures. And so um, I just, I, I wrote it and then I just set it aside, didn't really, you know, develop it into much. Took another, that initial script ended up like 250 pages. And then several years later, I met a woman who was a writer and she told me about an online class. I took that and the book shrank down to 150 pages. And then I didn't do anything with it for a long time. And then somebody told me about a one woman show class. And I thought, oh, and, and I went there and I thought, oh, I'm going to write a one woman show. Because as an actor, you sit around waiting for a job or you create your own work. And with the uh, technology today, people can shoot their own videos. They can, you know, do so many things. But I wrote my own one woman show from the topics in the book. And then, um, but when you're staging it, you know, you have to have a way to bring the 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 story to life. So I added the word Pisces because that's my astrological sign. And, and that's what I kind of guess. I, I was like, that that has to be her sign. <laughs> oh yes, for sure. And I I had these two characters in the in the um solo show. One was Sam and he was like a salmon swimming upstream. He was the guy that goes against the grain, the one always, you know, trying to beat the system. And then I had Flo, the other part of myself, which is the one that goes with the flow. And, you know, she's the peacemaking part of me. And so it was fun to stage it. And um, then I, I set it aside and didn't do anything with it. And now I'm uh, on the cusp of my 75th birthday. I'll turn 75 in uh, February. And at my age, every week or month, I'm hearing about another friend or acquaintance or someone in the media who I've loved their whole career and they're dying or they're diagnosed with some critical illness. And I thought, really, you're going to die with your book in a box under your bed? <laughs> Why not pull it out and do something? So about exactly one year ago, I pulled it out and I found somebody online who knew how to who taught self-publishing, and I sort of had that person guide me through the process of how to get it from the box and to the um, bookshelf. So. You know, I've never, I've never heard of that. And I know that there's many of us out there that are writers, right? That we write a book and we just put it under the bed, uh -huh. you know. And then we we do pass away, and you know, we all we all pass. And we and somebody finds us and they're like, well, why did they ever not publish this? Why did they just, you know, because mm -hmm. we're always waiting for that perfect time when we should just right. put it out, like just do it, you exactly. know. And that's what I, I, I was told a year ago was just do it. Yes. And whether people like it or not, try it. If you don't yes. try, you don't know. Right. So I, I really like that you tried it and that you went and you did this book. Um, you know, and your subtitle of this book is Life Beyond Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. Well, you had me right there. I was just like, <laughs> those are things that we talk about, you know, in the 80s. Yes. We talk a little, about, a little bit about it now, but not as much as we did back then, you know. When, right. You we know, were like, in the middle of it. <laughs> right. We were, you know, where we went and did the um, burning bras and stuff like that. You know, we don't talk about that stuff. Uh, were you part of that? Uh, oh, God, yes. oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. In fact, I was a camp counselor while I was in college uh, after my sophomore year, I think. And I, I went away to camp and I, I um, decided that I wasn't going to shave my legs or shave my armpits anymore. I had seen a movie and she took her shirt off and she had this, you know, hair under her arms. And I thought, oh, that's hot. And my then husband said, I said, did you think that was sexy? He said, yeah. I said, oh, I'm not shaving anymore. So um, my, my parents drove me up to this camp and they said, 
you we're not driving you up there unless you shave those arms and legs so they made me shave before i got in the car and then i didn't shave the whole eight weeks that i was away at the camp and so i became this role model for these kids at camp and they all went oh my, their arms and legs all grown out all hippie style <laughs> but it was free back then it was fun like you know you didn't really care about what anybody thought back then you just did what felt good right comfortable right now um, i have an 11 year old granddaughter and she's starting to have hair under her armpits and on her legs and she's got a mustache she's got a pretty hairy dad and stuff and she could care less <laughs> i said to her you know are your friends shaving yet and she's like uh -huh. <laughs> i'm not doing it <laughs> yeah, she's like not interested <laughs> so they, they're going back to our way <laughs> I, I and that's what i feel i feel like we're going backwards right a lot of history is being repeated a lot of trends are coming back uh bell bottoms are starting to come back I know. Uh, you know right? I, I got bullied in school for bell bottoms all the time and i'd be like i hate these things and now they're coming back and it's like oh my goodness they're so cool i still have mine <laughs> i've got a <laughs> pair that's got they've got this amazing tie-dye down the side and oh uh, they're very cool and every time I, I think that's what I like about your book is the tie dye. Yeah. The, the color flow. Isn't it fun? Yeah. Right. So how did you come up with this? Was it from tie dye? No, a, a woman, you know, that group that I was in um, where the guy was teaching me self-publishing, I put a, a cover up that I had in mind and, you know, you, you, that he had a thing where you could just put stuff up and people could give you feedback and they were all like, yeah, I'm not feeling it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, um, I'm not doing that. <laughs> right. So I, I, I know this lady who's a designer. Um, she, her name is on the back of the book. Her name is Aviva Heston. And she, um, I, I said to her, I, I think I need something a little more vibrant. And so she came up with that design and I've had so many compliments on it. It really does capture the vibe of the book, wouldn't you say? And um, my whole life at that time. So well, and, and the, the story has a nice flow, right? It, it, it goes up and down. It's right. like the flow of the, the colors on the cover. Uh, right. You know, you go from heartache to uh, parenthood to... Uh, addictions and recovery to finding out that you had Gray's disease. Uh, you, you know, like the, it's a personal memoir. It's a beautiful book. It's really done well. I really, really love it, Joyce. Uh, I want to get into, let's start with the MTV uh, mm -hmm. because in the book, I don't, I, I'm just going to give little, little key things for people to go and grab the book so i i don't want to give the book away too much we don't want to share too much because we want people to grab a copy um but let's talk about the mtv the rejection letter and then the next day the phone call let's talk a little, a little bit about that right well mtv was a new medium uh right when i was in graduate school and i was getting my master's in radio and television and i had this class in cinematography and he gave us a homework assignment and i found out somehow you know there was no internet really happening yet and i um i found out the specs for the, a, an mtv television show called the basement tapes and it was like a precursor to the competition shows that are on tape television now where the audience calls in and votes for their favorite singer or their favorite dancers or whatever. And this was playing unknown videos of unknown bands. And um, I took it into class and I said to my teacher, how would I have to shoot my homework so it fits the specifications for MTV? And he said, well, you're going to have to shoot it on film. And there were no cell phones. You couldn't just shoot it, you know, yourself. And I had to hire a production company and it cost $10,000 to hire this company. It also cost us $10,000 to record the song that we were doing. And it was a song I wrote. Um, I wanted to write a nonsense lyric like the do, 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 da, 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 
or the do run run. <laughs> I don't know. I like that one. The do run run run. The, yes. The, you so, know, the music back then had like a little flow to it where you wanted to get into it, right? Yes. Get into the course. Exactly. And, and so I, um, I wanted to write, the, I wanted to shoot this music video so I could turn it in as my homework. So I'm not sure the guy had ever had a student pay $10,000 to shoot their homework before. But um, once it was finished, I sent it into MTV and I got the form letter back. And basically it said, don't call us. We'll call you. We'll let you know in six weeks if we're going to play it. You know, I just wanted to scream or get high because I was so disappointed. And um, yeah, the next day I got a FedEx letter uh, or I got a phone call and she said, we're going to FedEx the paperwork, have all your band members sign the release and um, we're playing your video right away. And so they did. So Joyce, how was that feeling? Like you were rejected and then you got the, the let, you got the phone call, right? Like that, and that was in a matter of a couple of days, correct? Yes, it was, you know, thankfully it was a quick turnaround. So I was in the depths of despair and two days later, later, uh, you know, I got the phone call. So, you know, thankfully I had the bandmates to all kind of sympathy, sympathize with me. So, um, it, you know, and then we also got to celebrate together. We got together to sign the papers and celebrate. And then when we when the show aired, we got to all sit down and watch it together. So, well, the reason that I asked you that is because you know it's the up and downs, right? Yep. In in that field, in film and in industry and music and all of that, right? It's the up, the down, the up, the down. No, we're not going to take that song, but we're going to take this song. We're not going to take that film. We're going to do this film. You right. know. Um, oh, yeah, I had it just last week. <laughs> I had an audition for a feature film. I haven't heard crickets, you know, so you you just do your best and you put it out there and some, you win some, you lose some. You know, I've had the biggest auditions of my life in the last six months. I mean, one of the auditions was for a feature film that would have absolutely changed my life didn't get it. And I, I, and I couldn't have done anything more to try to get it. It was a singing audition. There was singing involved in the character. And I hired the guy who is the vocal court coach for the show, The Voice, because I live in LA and <laughs> she has to, connections. <laughs> just happened to know the guy. And, uh, you know, I know I did a good job. In fact, the casting director has called me back in or something more. So I know there wasn't anything wrong with my audition, but I saw an illustration of the film that is coming. And my character in that illustration was somebody really big. So they decided oh. to go with a big, heavy woman. Well, that's not me. I, you know, you win some, you lose Well, some. we could wrap some pillows and some duct tape around you. <laughs> uh, yeah. mm -hmm. So, yeah, you, you can't win them all. You just do your best and let it go. Well, I think that's an important message, right, for all our listeners. You know, it just keep trying. And, you know, if it doesn't happen, let it go. You know, try the next one and keep going. And I and that's what I really liked about your book was you mm -hmm. kept going. All of right. these things kept knocking you down and you kept saying, you know what, ugh. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not doing well with this, but I'm going to do this and I'm going to try. And I, you know, uh, I want to get into, um, in your bio, you, when I read it, I was like, why would you, you put both of your daughters have survived lousy parenting. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about lousy parenting because for the listeners out there, they might want to know why you said that. Well, um, it's, uh, my sobriety was actually hinged on my daughters. And by, say, by that, I mean, um, my daughters were 13 and 16 when I got sober. And by sober, I mean, I was a daily pot smoker from the age of 20 to the age of 40. In fact, I started smoking at that camp I was talking about earlier that my parents were driving me to. They drove me up to Wisconsin from Indiana. And at that camp, um, a counselor invited me to go uh, into town and we sat down on a baseball diamond and she 
passed me a joint and I smoked that joint and I fell madly in love. And I thought, I am going to do this till the day I die. I loved the way it made me feel. And I was 20 years old. And by today's standards, that is so late to start smoking or drinking. Um, I really didn't drink much until I turned 21. But my my children came along and all of a sudden, I, I my first daughter was born when I was 24 and my second one when I was 27. I got married at age 21 to the first guy I ever slept with. And then um, by the time they were teenagers at 13 and 16, when I was going to leave Indiana and move to LA to pursue my dreams, they just said they'd had it with me. And by that, um, the lousy parenting involved, like I said, I moved a guy into our house and, you know, so they, they were in the position of having to answer their friends who were going, well, who does your mom love? Does she love your dad or does she love her boyfriend? You know, and and I had a girlfriend who's driving and this conversation is in the back seat when she's taking the girls home from Girl Scouts. And she says, um, my daughter goes, oh, no, she loves them both. You know, like he does. <laughs> <laughs> kid wants to have to be answering questions like that, you know, and yeah. I would do things like I was always very active. I'd show up, I'd be the room mother, but I'd show up like an idiot. I mean, I, it's a Valentine party. So I'm going to wear red fishnet stockings and a red mini dress with heart buttons. How adorable, you know, <laughs> again, just no regard for how humiliating it was for my daughter to have to say, oh, that's my mother. Um, so it's that kind of lousy parenting. It's like just being absolutely uh, oblivious to their feelings and how my behavior impacted them. Um, I, I was on the Natch. I'm loud and I'm a screamer. That's how my mother, you know, behaved you know, yell at the kids to do their chores or whatever. And so that would be me. I'd be like, get this filthy place cleaned up, you know. And if I were high, I'd be like, girls, you need to vacuum. <laughs> so it was and, an up and down, right? It was, uh, yeah. What, what, then, what, what are we getting today from mom? Right. And then they would go, she's been smoking. And they'd say it so that I could see their lips and they I'd know that they knew that I was high. And they just they didn't dig it, they weren't into it, they didn't want to be a part of it. So they stayed behind when I moved out to LA. And they didn't come back anytime soon. I mean, I spoke to them every week. It's not like they said we hate you. They didn't at all. We spoke every week. I saw them at the holidays, etc. But um they just uh, did, they wanted to live with more stability. And their dad is a very low key, mellow. He's a very good person, a wonderful father. And uh, they just stayed in Indiana. And I was out here. My youngest daughter moved out here when I was three years sober. And then my eldest daughter moved out when she graduated college. So she stayed in the mid Midwest to go to school and then moved out here after graduation. Yeah, there's a part in the book, I, where is it? The end the end, and then the beginning. Mm -hmm. And in that part, uh, you were seven years sober and you loved Shelly, but Shelly had to step down from being a sponsor. Do you wanna share how that changed your life? Well, um, what it did is it, it made me go looking for, I, I, I had always had, um, someone helping me with my sobriety, somebody with more time than I had who could co sort of give me pointers on how to navigate through my uh, life without pot and without booze. And so um, when Shelly moved away, I thought I'm going to go to a group where people are more active. And when I was, when I went to this group, which I still belong to today. There, it's a very huge meeting every Wednesday. We probably have five or six hundred people. Back then, they even had more. They more had like a eleven hundred. Um, but um, I met the guy that I'm married to today by making that change. 
Um, it put me in this bigger group with much more active um, sobriety where they did a lot of uh, parties on the weekends and things like that. And that's where I ended up meeting the guy that I'm married to today. Well, so. Joyce, you know, sometimes some goodbyes are a, a, an opening for us as well, right? It pushes us to take accountability and stepping up and responsibility for our own lives, yes. uh, you know? Um, and that's how I look at it sometimes when people leave, right, is it was their time to leave so that we could take that journey, we could open that new door, you know, exactly. we could we could take those steps. And had she not left, you would not have met the man that you're married to. Very likely not. <laughs> LA is a big city. <laughs> <laughs> right? It, it is big. So let's talk about a little bit about living in LA. How is that for you, Joyce? I love it. I always say I live in paradise. You know, it's not for everyone. We have a lot of traffic. It gets pretty daggone hot with climate change. But um, the thing about it is, it is a place where, you know, dreams are possible. And even if, you know, to this day, I'm not a working actor. It's very possible I could become one any minute, and maybe not. But by living here in the heart of the beast, the belly of the beast, as they say, um, anything's possible. I mean, I know people who have achieved so much success in the film and television industry. Uh, they are my friends today. Um, they have I, I don't know them from the business. I know them from other social activities or from them being in recovery alongside me. Um, but uh, it, it just feels like you're just in touch with greatness. Just like in my band, you know, we had uh, one of our guitar players was and still is Meryl Streep's brother-in-law. And so his brother is married to her and um, he, uh, the, the brother-in-law came to my house and watched one of our rehearsals one time and then went home and told Meryl that he thought our band was pretty good. So then she came to see our band perform at a club, you know, and who can say that, you know, and I'm not saying Indianapolis is kind of small townish. But at the end of the, the calendar year, when the Indianapolis newspaper listed all the cool things that happened that year, Meryl Streep going to see Abstractions at the Hummingbird was one of the things they listed. <laughs> so it was very cool. Let's talk about the band and how you got the name for the band and how many people were in the band. Well, um, I had an evolution of bands. Uh, I started in a band where uh, one of my employees at my store had a girlfriend who was starting a band and she was learning to play the drums. And he said, hey, they need a singer. You want to go check them out? And I went there and um, and they weren't terrific. They were kind of learning, but but it was a lot of fun. They had we had four girls and one guy. The guy played guitar and then they had a female bass player, female keyboards, drummer, and uh, me. And uh, we, you know, I wanted to get out there and go play. And they wanted to keep rehearsing. And so there was a conflict. So that band fell apart. My next band was called um, Kicks. And that band opened for the Go-Go's at a little club. We opened for Meatloaf at a bigger club. And um, then we changed personnel again and with our newest band and it, we ended up with, it was four girls, I mean, four guys and two girls at the end. And that band became Abstractions. Our favorite band at the time was Elvis Costello and his oh. band was Elvis Costello and the Attractions. So it, it was a bit of an homage to Elvis Costello that we named our band Abstractions. And um, yeah, we went into the recording studio. First, we recorded a 45. And I went to New York with that 45. And basically, everybody was like, what? No video? I was like, dude, 
I got a 45. You know how much work it was to get a 45. Now you want to know where my video is, for God's sakes. Um, so anyway, then I went home and we, we uh, sent our record around the country. There was a thing at the time called record pools. I don't know if they exist oh. today, but there was no internet. So you ha didn't have a w an easy way to promote your music. Um, so the, I sent it around to these record pools who got the record for free and their obligation was to take it out to a club, play it and give us feedback on what songs people responded to. And that Wawa song was the one that was clearly the favorite. And again, it was a song I wrote. Um, I don't play an instrument. So I wrote it vocally and standing in the shower. <laughs> I just... Saying that's that. where some of the biggest hits are made in the shower. <laughs> yeah, just ask any clean person, they'll tell you. <laughs> but so, yeah, I came out of the shower and sang it to uh, the guitar player. At that time, we had a female lead guitarist, and um, she added an intro to it. And uh, so, in the ownership of that Wawa song, she and I are the co writers. and. Then we shot the video to that. Well, that's really cool. Like, and, and that's what I mean. Like your book shares all this incredible stuff uh, for anybody that would like to grab the book. Like I, uh, I highly recommend this book. Uh, Miss Liz is going to leave her book review and you'll get to see what, what Miss Liz feels about the book. Uh, Joyce, when you sent me the book, I was just, you said it was going to be an easy read. And I was like, oh, okay, well, a lot of people that send me books tell me that they're easy. And I was just like, oh, please, because as I'm getting older, my eyes are getting weaker and I'm just like, okay, I can do this. And as soon as I got into it, I liked it because the first chapter is the cha-cha change and it's <laughs> almost like music, right? So it's always yeah. like cha-cha-cha-cha, like, you know, like, like let, let, let's dance, right? Well, so it's, it's a David Bowie song. He's got cha-cha-cha-cha changes. You know? Right. It gets you right away. Like the, the, the titles of the chapters and all of that as well. Grab me. And I was like, Oh, I a lot of them are song titles. <laughs> oh, well, look at that. I, yes. I knew there was music involved somewhere. I was just like, exactly. yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I was just like, okay. Uh, Joyce, let's get into your tea. You gave me three words, uh, tenacious enlightenment and awaken. Why'd you give me those three words for your tea? Well, I think um, being tenacious is something I've always strived for. You know, it means to not ever give up and to, you know, be somebody who is persistently um, pursuing whatever they uh, are interested in. And um, what were the other two? Enlightened? Enlightenment and awakened. Yes. And so both those two, awakened and enlightened, are... Um, the things that I think are possible when you are clean and sober, when you're not in an altered state. Uh, I remember going to see a therapist um, right before I moved to L.A. And she said, you know, you need to read this book. And it was a book um, called The Road Less Travel. She said, you have to read this book. And you have to not drink or use between sessions. And I thought that seems a bit extreme. <laughs> uh, but she said, you're asking too much out of me. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I can do that. And I couldn't. I mean, every, and it, that's how I knew I was an addict. I didn't know I was an alcoholic or an addict until someone held me accountable. Nobody had ever said, you must not drink between sessions, between meetings, between nobody had ever given me that directive. And when I couldn't do it, when I had to every week go back and go, well, you know, I didn't buy any pot. I just smoked other people's weed. Does that count? <laughs> or, um, you know, or, or I went to a David Bowie concert. How could I not have a beer? Um, then that's how I, she said, look, the point of therapy is to get to what's real. And you'll never get to what's real if you're in an altered state. And I think you can't be enlightened if you're not if you're in an altered state. Yeah, so it's sort of my goal, you know, at this age, to and and has been for the last thirty four years to try to be as 
present for whatever is happening at all times, you know, and it's not that hard to do, although it can be, you know, when you run into those rough spots like aging parents or kids making bad decisions or your, you know, yeah. friends having trauma. Uh, there are a million reasons why it can be difficult to stay serene. But um, I think if it's if it's your primary focus each day, then it's easier. So. Yeah. Well, and there was another chapter in your book that really grabbed my attention, and it was in the middle of the book. Um, I'm just looking for it here. New face, new body, new life. That chapter really got my attention uh, as well because we talked about the uh, weight size, um, you know, and have you called yourself? Where is it? What did you call? It? looks like an overweight googly eye freak <laughs> is what you put in the book okay. and i was like that's a pretty interesting description for for yourselves well yeah i had graves disease which i didn't know what it was i'd never heard of it and i was diagnosed with it right before i left indiana to move and um, one of the things it does is it creates swelling behind the eyes and pushes the eyeballs forward so they're bulgy. And um, so my eyes wouldn't close all the way. I mean, they were so pushed out that the eyelid wouldn't quite close all the way. And um, yeah, and, and graves can affect people one of two ways. Some people lose an extreme amount of weight and that's how they know they have the disease. Other people, like in my case, I had insatiable appetite. So I would eat all this food and still be starving. And it was the thyroid that was making me feel that way. And so when I had Graves, I weighed more than I weighed at nine months pregnant, both pregnancies. <laughs> I weighed more. Wow. And it was pretty traumatic. It was like, what is this? You know, I'd look in the mirror and, and not recognize myself. And the timing couldn't be worse. Here I was moving to L.A., hoping to work my way into the, you know, film and television in industry. And here I looked like this complete freak. I didn't look anything like myself. And um, I ended up having to have several eye surgeries to deal with those bulgy eyes. And um, they had to give me a thing called radio iodine back in Indiana and before I left. And, you know, it's kind of creepy. Somebody's got these space age gloves on and they're handing you this beverage in a leaded cup and you're supposed to drink it. <laughs> you know, it's like... You won't touch it, but I am supposed to drink it. Okay. So, so are you still living with Gray's disease? Well, no. Um, they said the the radio iodine would either kill the thyroid, which would be inconsequential, or it would make it go normal, or it would make it go low. And in my case, it made it go low because Graves means your thyroid is is elevated. And it's dangerous. Your heart is racing and you can have a stroke. You can have a heart attack. It's very dangerous. You can't live with untreated Graves' disease. So, um, yeah, mine went low and I have to take a little tiny um, thyroid pill every day. And I've been taking them for 35 years. With so is there a certain age when that hits a person? Is it for women, for men? Like no, it, it's it's an autoimmune disease like diabetes. It just, you know, either you have it or you don't. And in, in my case, my kids and I all have autoimmune issues. We all have our own special one, but um, yeah, we all do. So. I, lo I love your attitude with life, you know, with everything that you've been through. Like you're, you're that, uh, that mom that I want to hang out with, right? Like... <laughs> <laughs> you know that's my mom oh okay well let me go let me go hang out with mom <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate that thank you so joyce i want to get into um i want to get into your word because your word that you gave me was energetic and we talked about it at the beginning of the show mm -hmm. uh you were the energizer bunny so yeah. when you hear that word energetic what do you think of 
besides the bunny? Well, I think of, you know, a calendar that is ridiculous. Like last night at 730, I had three places I was supposed to be. Um, I volunteer uh, with a political uh, group uh, here in, in the U.S. We have two major parties and I'm very active in one of the parties and I'm on the board and they had moved their meeting to last night. Then somebody had asked me to be a speaker at a marijuana anonymous meeting and talk about my recovery. And I'm also on a committee at my church where um, I go to a church that has no creed and no dogma. So it's not a, a, you know, a big, it's Unitarian Universalism. And I'm on the worship committee. And all three of those were supposed to meet simultaneously. That's what happens if you're the energize. You know, I, when I tell people how many things I've done in a given day, they just go, I'm exhausted just hearing your list. I mean, because here we are. I was at a meeting at 7 a.m. It's my regular meeting that I go to on Tuesdays where I have a commitment. And then I went from there to my church where we have a houseless drop-in center and people come for a free meal. And we've got a clothing closet and I work in the clothing closet, passing out socks and underwear and, you know, use jeans and t-shirts and whatnot. So I was there. Then I came home, did my walk in the neighborhood, took a shower. And now here I am with you. And, you know, in LA, it's not yet one o'clock. <laughs> so, <laughs> She's still got another eight hours of entertainment to do, guys. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm going to be watching a Dodger game tonight. And, you know, just I have a big full life, which is helpful because if things don't go your way on any given day, you can always just go next. <laughs> you know, oh, that didn't work out the way I wanted. Oh, well next what what's next on my agenda you know what i mean and um and i know people who are 75 who are my age and they can barely move or they can barely um you know drive or they they have so many things that are hindering them from having a big vibrant life um my husband is 12 years my junior so he is 62. I am 75. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm 74, excuse me. I'll be 75. But we're having this trip called um, 100 Years of Life and Love. We've named the trip, which is going to be, we're going for the holidays to Australia and Tasmania. And we're going to be celebrating my upcoming 75th birthday and our 25th wedding anniversary. So, um, you know, he is a pretty active guy, but I always am more active than he. <laughs> and, you know, and he's 12 years younger. But, you know, while I did all that stuff today, he was home. <laughs> He was taking the easy flow before right. the big flow comes, right? <laughs> right. Well, and and to be honest, he was sleeping in, but I put clothes in the washer before I left the house for that 7 a.m. meeting. He put them in the dryer and took them out. I ran the dishwasher before I left for that 7 a.m. meeting. When I came home from church volunteering, he had emptied the dishwasher. I had put out the little thing where you boil eggs when I left for my 7 a.m. meeting, when I came home, he had boiled the eggs, peeled them and put them in the fridge. So we have a, you know, a, when one finds that match made in heaven, um, I think you want, you're looking for a helpmate and I have a helpmate and so does he. There's a part in your book that you talked about internet dating. Mm. Is this where you met this man or is this no. before this man? <laughs> No, I had got, he had been um, just, he had been taken too long to get around to asking me <laughs> out. Like he was flirting with me and, and, you know, we were talking on a regular basis. We would see each other 
and he would talk with me, but he never asked for my phone number. He never, um, you know, made any effort to ask me out. And so some girlfriends said, you know, hey, we're getting together on January 1st and we're signing up for internet dating. Do you want to join us? And I was like, yes, I do. This guy yeah, in the book, it says, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I'm signing up. And, and I thought the idea was neat. I liked the idea of kind of being able to shop for a guy. You know what I mean? So I would, I would be able to put in, I'm looking for this kind of guy. And then if I didn't get any responses, I'd say, okay, how about this kind of guy? And I'd just tweak a few descriptors and then some names would pop up. Um, and I thought, I thought it was fun. I had made my, I had given myself a rule that I wouldn't give my phone number to anyone until we had had, had six exchanges back and forth, because you learn a lot in, you know, email exchanges with a total stranger. I'm sure you find this with your guests. And yeah, um, yeah so I was in the midst of doing that and having fun with it. And all of a sudden he asked me out and I thought, I'll just do both. I'll just you know, keep doing the internet and date him at the same time. And then I just sort of said, wait a minute, don't be an idiot. You've wanted to date this guy for, you know, how many months he's finally asked you out, just date his butt. You can always sign back up for the internet later. Right? You can always just resubscribe to the, the, the exactly. membership or whatever. Right? About the fact that you lost your $35 because. <laughs> but you found a match made in heaven. I know. <laughs> it's I'm worth not... the 35 bucks, right? Exactly. Yes. So absolutely. It, it, it's incredible. Like I said, this book takes you on a really flow, like, and the, and the cover again. For everybody that's listening and will watch the replay and check out this book, I really highly recommend this book because it takes you on a flow of good, strong tea. And in the book, I also found a part where there was a tea. You took the tea set home from Japan. You want to tell us a little bit about that tea set from Japan? Oh, yes. Um, my when my uh, when I was a kid, we lived in Japan for a year and my mother had. Um, had uh, bought some china, fine china, while she lived there, and uh, at, and when my I, when I was in high school, my father was in the military for my whole childhood, and he was stationed in Vietnam, and while he was there, he sent home catalogs of, of, of brochures from the Norotaki China Company, and he said, "Everyone, pick a pattern." So my sister and my mother and I all chose a pattern. And um, at one point when my parents were elderly and my mother was starting to, um, they, I was gonna move them from Indiana out to LA. Um, I selected a tea set that she had and I still have it to this day and it's just lovely. It's just a very sweet pattern. Nothing I would ever choose, but, um, you know, it's a reminder of her. And, and, and that's what I love about tea is the story behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, wh where were you? Who were you with? Who made it? Who painted it? Who, who drank from it? You know, there's so much stories that are in that one teacup or that one tea set, you know, right. and it brings back those memories and the moments. And, and that's why I love tea. Um, you know, I'm not a big tea drinker, but I love sharing tea stories, you know, on how we all come together, you know, cause you can have juice in there. You can have wine in there. You can have, uh, you know, chocolate milk. Uh, I've done a tea party where there was chocolate milk instead of tea. And people were like, this, this is a tea party, right? Uh, yeah, but we, we can have chocolate milk in a teacup. Can we not, <laughs> <laughs> you know, can we not be different? Well, um, I'm a big tea drinker. I like to drink it, but I don't drink caffeine. So I'm one of those weird people who I've never had a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. So it's tea for me. Yeah. Well, I, I'm with my granddaughter. I'm always like, whatever you want to put in your cup, sweetheart, you know, mm -hmm. let's sit and have a story time. Let's have like a good, time of bonding in that oh yeah um, we've had some beautiful tea parties with my granddaughter um yeah. and yeah she would set up all the she'd get the blanket out and set up all the stuffed animals and yeah really good fun 
Love it. So Joyce, before we wrap up, you gave me your favorite color is peacock blue. And I love when my guests give me not just a color, but add pizzazz to it. Uh, you know, and today I'm wearing my peacock shirt for you. Uh, Appreciate Joyce. it. So tell me what it is about the peacock blue that you love. Well, mostly it's because every time I wear it, like when I wear this shirt, people just give me gazillions of compliments and they actually say, that's a really good color on you. <laughs> so I, um, yeah, I just over the years have found that it seems to suit my skin tone. Um, my mother was Japanese Hawaiian, so I do have an odd kind of skin coloring. And my dad was just, you know, a, a Hoosier. He was from Indiana and a wasp. So um, it's just, you know, for whatever reason, this color I think works for me and it makes me feel vibrant. So. Oh, I like it. I love it. Yeah. You know, and I love that blue. Like I'm, a, I'm my favorite colors are blue and orange and the blue that you're wearing. I, I it's like one of my favorite blues. Yes. Um, there's so many different colors of blues out there. Uh, you know, and I love when you, when, when my guests say, it's not just blue, Miss Liz, it's a peacock blue. Now we're going into a nice color, right? We're going into a different flow. And that goes right back to your book as well is I noticed that you have almost the same color as my shirt uh -huh. on, exactly. on the color of your book, right? So uh, if anybody would like to get your book, Joyce, where could they find this book? Well, it's actually everywhere at this point. Um, it's on Amazon as either a Kindle book paperback or an audio book. And I think the audio book is a lot of fun because in the book I say, this happened, I wrote a song about it and here are some of the lyrics. But in the audio book, I say, this happened, I wrote a song about it and a recording of my band playing the song comes in. And there are I maybe five or six songs that have segments uh, in the audio book. But it's it's really everywhere. It's at Barnes and Noble. It's at uh, Spotify. It's Amazon Books, and um, even if you have a a, a a library app called Hoopla, it's there for free. <laughs> so, um, so what final message would you like to leave everybody with today, Joyce? Well, for sure, I'd like to tell your baby boomers, you know, rock till you drop. And uh, just keep the party going. And, uh, you know, for everybody else, just, you know, it's never too late to live your best life. So get on with it already. See, that's, I like, I like that motivation, right? Like, just do it, just get it done. You know, it's back to the books under the bed. Let's get those books published, right? We want, we don't want to have books under beds, guys. We want to have them published. We want you to get yourself out there. Uh, well, Joyce, I really enjoyed this conversation with you. And, you know, like we went from teacups to Grey's Disease to MTV to, uh, you know, um, colors, all of that. We, we really went with the flow. Uh, I really want to thank you for reaching out to me and being a guest on Tea Time. Uh, I can do these shows without all of my guests. And I get to learn something from each and every one of you. Um, so, Joyce, if anybody wanted to reach out to you to have you as a guest or to speak with you or to have a voiceover because you do that as well. We didn't really get into that, but you do voiceovers as well. Um, where can they find you? Well, I, I got a website, which is uh, joycefiddler.com. And, uh, and yeah, they can also email me, enerjoyce at joycefiddler.com. One D. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to my listeners and viewers out there. Uh, we did have a tea time schedule for yesterday, but it has been rescheduled to November 5th at 3 p.m. with uh, Jose Peral. Well, he'll be speaking about his personal life story uh, and his book, uh, From Her Heroes to Villain, uh, where he was a hostage for five years in the Venezuela uh, Central 6. So we're, we're going to talk about that as well on November 5th. Uh, the press release for November's lineup has also been released. So check that out. There's incredible stories out there as well. And in December, you might see Joyce again, because there's a reunion show that's happening December 19th. And Miss Liz will be reaching out to all seasons, season one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, 
And if you would like to know more about Miss Liz, check out my website at www.misslizisteatime.com. Go over to the YouTube channel. Give it a little uh, ring on that doorbell again if you enjoyed this conversation today. Uh, and we have many, many more incredible conversations coming to the table. Uh, you'll be notified when, then, when we're live streaming and you can join the conversations with your questions, comments, and support as well. Um, again, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and blessing Miss Liz with your teas because I could not serve your tea for you any other way unless you come to the table and sit with me. So until then, stay blessed, stay true, and we will see everybody November 4th for the first tea time, November 5th, and then November 7th, and 18th, 19th, 21st, and 28th. So check out those dates. We have special teas for all of you to enjoy. And keep sharing, keep spilling, and keep being true to yourself. Thank you.